author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and today I'm in the Seattle home of author Robert Dagoni, author of In the Clearing. Welcome to Author. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. You know, Bob, we've had a bunch of these conversations, both uh, through my radio show and here on Author, and I don't think I've ever asked you really how it began. I know that you, you were a journalist, and obviously you had a, a career as a lawyer, but um, as I understand it, really writing book writing, novel writing, was that always the plan yeah. underneath it all, even when you went off to college? Seventh grade. I know you went and told the story in yeah. front of, at your Catholic school, right? Yeah, yeah. seventh grade. Seventh grade. Um, I was asked to give a speech on slavery, and I yeah. chose the position of an abolitionist. Short of a long story, I gave the speech. When I was done, nobody clapped. I mean, you know, everybody gets clapped. Right. Nobody clapped. And I was like, <laughs> and I looked, and Sister Kathleen goes like this to me. I'm like, oh, no, not uh, What have again. I done? And I went outside, and, and she opened the door to the next classroom. She said, wait here. And there was two seventh grades, two eighth grades. And about two minutes later, she came back out, and she goes, come on. And she goes, give your speech. And that's when I kind of knew it. But, but, but I knew at that moment. I mean, I, I knew at that moment it was like, this is cool. This is what I want to do. I want to I wanna write, and I, wanna, I wanted to act. And I, I did end up acting for a while. But th this was really what I wanted to do. But so, but that's an interesting moment because that could go towards acting. You know, I did theater as well. I was very interested in it, and and so you were in physically in front of people yeah. telling the story. But that's a different thing than what you do now. Although you do get in front of people, obviously. Yeah. And so, why books? Why books instead of screenwriting, instead of acting, instead of? I was a better writer than I was an actor. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing is, when I write, I write with an envisionment, if you will, that there, there are people reading it. So my characters are acting for me. When I'm writing, my characters are acting. And, and I am perceiving what's, what's so the feedback. You're watching it like a movie. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's funny. I will write a scene, and, and I will have a very strong sense of, this scene worked. This, this scene was good. And inevitably, that's the scene where my agent or my editor will call me up and say, oh my God, I was crying during this scene. I was crying. But that's good scene. to know because it's better than you think, this killed. And then yeah. they say, you've got to cut that. Yeah. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I probably get that too. But the last book that I, the, the Tracy Crosswhite number four in the series, I just got through writing and I'm in the you know, kind of the final edit stages. But both my editor and my agent both said the same thing. And I remember when I read when I wrote this scene. It's a scene when they're in somebody's house and they're having a big Italian dinner to celebrate, you know, something. And I remember when I wrote it, I, I said, This this works. This moves people. And so I don't know where you stand on this. I'm I get pretty woo-woo when it comes to the writing process. And for me, when I have moments like that, there's always a feeling of like that came through me. I heard that, I don't say anymore where did it come from, but there's a sense of it being delivered to me yeah. and me sort of doing the best I can to get out of the way. Yeah. Is that, do you I, ascribe I, to I that? I mean, I agree. I, you know, years ago I, I heard Diana Gabaldon say something very yeah. similar and it yeah. was up at the Surrey Writers Conference and everyone, you know, I remember thinking, what a bunch of hokum. Right. Uh, and, and she's such a lovely lady. And now I'm in total agreement with her. I, I always tell people, I don't believe stories necessarily come from here. I think the really good ones come yeah. from here. Yeah. And when you can get it to come from here, you know it. And it's, it's just something that becomes very personal. Um, yeah, it's, it, the, when I'm writing my best is when I go back even the next day or two or three months later when I'm in the editing phase and I'm reading it and I don't recognize the writing. Yeah. I'm like, wow, I, did I write this? Right. And I'm looking at the scene, I'm thinking, did they edit this? Did they change this? And I'll go back and look at earlier drafts on the computer. I'll go, no, I, that, I wrote that. That's, that. Those are my words. But they don't, they don't feel like they're mine. And I, I think that is, comes when you're, you're in that moment and you just, you're, you're just, like you said, you're, just, you're letting the story come through you. I had a very interesting conversation with Kristen Hanna. Actually, it was an email conversation with Kristen Hanna after she wrote The Nightingale 
which I thought was a brilliant book. And I emailed her to tell her and her response to me was something in the way of sometimes good stories come to us and we just need to get out of their way. You know, and I really hope our viewers take that in because it's a hard thing to describe, but it is, I think, what we're looking for, a sense of asking and letting the answer come. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't be afraid of not knowing. Yeah, exactly. You know, you sit down at the type, type right, sit down <laughs> at the computer, and, and you really don't know. Right. But you can't be afraid of that. Um, in fact, probably the best advice that I got from my good friend Stephen James, who I teach with, he wrote a book, and, and I was going through his book because I was struggling with this last book. And he said to me in the book, he said, if you know the end of the scene, that can't be the end of the scene. So come up with something else. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm not going anywhere at, at the moment, so I'm going to try it. And, and I wrote the scene, and I thought, okay. Well, and I thought, no, I can't do that. So I'm, and I just, I'm going to do this. And I went, oh, oh, my Lord. I just got the next four scenes, and, and I know who the killer is. And, you know, and I just, so you can't, you can't be afraid. Uh, you, you just can't. You, you have to find a place and a time where you're not rushed, you're, you're not panicked, you're not worried about deadlines. You're just, you just sit down and you just say, you just get in the moment and you say, where are my characters at this point in time and where am I going to go? Um, it's, it's interesting you bring it up. It's a, it's a fine balance and I, and I think that's the hardest part to teach young writers is there's a fine balance between letting your characters run amok Right. right? And, then, and then you've written 1,200 pages that have nothing to do with the story, and I've done that. And giving your characters that freedom to be the, who they are. Yeah. And they're not you. No. And that, that can be scary at times. They're not your pawns. They're not. They should surprise you, ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Why did that, where did that happen? Yeah. I, you know, that happens all, it happens all the time. It's, where did that come from? You know, my wife will read something I've written. And especially when it comes to the villains, you know, she'll be like, oh my God, what, <laughs> what did you think of these things? And, you know, it, it, but it, it, it isn't me. And I, and I always tell people that characters are not you, but they're of you. Yeah. But you have to let them be of you. Um, you. You can't force them to be you. You can't force them to not be you. You have to let them be who they are. And, and when you do that, then they, they really do come alive. And for people that don't write, that sounds really hokey. Yeah, it does. But for people that write and have been in that moment, it's, it is. It's one of those things where you kind of go, wow, this yeah. is kind of cool. You know, as long as I've known you, and I knew you before you published your first book, I think you were trying to publish it, but you were going through it. You've been a very ambitious guy. And I mean that in the best sense of the word, meaning you, didn't, you weren't someone who was going to use false humility to keep himself down. You had big goals. I did. And sometimes, and initially, they looked like they were going to get met, and then they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. And they looked, and they didn't. And this was a long time you, you went like this. Yeah, 15 years. It, right. And you're a hardworking guy. You've been a lawyer. You were a lawyer for years. And like, but now, in the last two or three years, you're really having that experience that I think you would hope for right when you set out on this journey. Yeah. So talk to me about that. So here you are. Now, this is, it's actually happening the way you wanted it. To. Yeah, and it's a really weird, it's a really weird feeling uh, because it just, it just happened. My sister's grave came out, and it just went crazy. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with my my publisher, you know, Thomas and Mercer. Uh, they just knew how to sell that book, and and they knew how to promote that book, and and then it just took off, and word of mouth took off, and and suddenly you're seeing, you know, you're not seeing hundreds of reviews on Amazon. You're seeing thousands of reviews on Amazon, yeah. and your your royalty statement isn't showing, <laughs> you know, hundreds of sales. It's so, it's showing tens of thousands of sales. Right. And, and it's, just, it's just kind of this really surreal moment. And you're working on your next book and, and you're getting you know, a dozen emails a day from readers you know, thanking you for the book you wrote and, and when's the next one coming out and when's it going to be there. And, and you, it, it's very humbling, especially yeah. when you've been doing it you know, as long as I have. And you have had those ups and downs. You've been on the New York Times bestseller list and you've been told by somebody, you know, we can't sell this book. So here we are and... You're having all this fabulous success, really what you wanted for yourself all those years. What would you say now to young 30-whatever-year-old Bob Dagoni, who was trying to start off, who was working so hard? Right. What would you say to him now that you're here? If you believe in yourself, then keep going. Yeah. And I think the other thing I, I would say is don't do it for you. Do it for the people around you. I don't, I don't write books for me. 
I don't, I don't write books because I want a new car. I don't, I want a new house. I don't want anything. I, I no? really don't. My father died eight years ago. And when he died, I, I was the only one in the house with my mom. All my brothers and sisters got there later. I helped take him out. You know, my mom wanted to make sure he was taken care of. I helped take him out. You know, she didn't want him zipped up, but he was in the bag. Put him in the back of the hearse, and I zipped the bag closed. When I came back in the house, um, I needed some time. I mean, it was a very emotional thing. And I went into his office, and I was sitting in his office. And my dad used to collect all these watches and all these rings from, you know, from New York City. You go to the, the street. You know, there were some were worth nothing, and some were worth a lot of money. And I was looking at all these rings and all these watches. And, and the man didn't get to take anything with him. And, I, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at these things. And, you know, he talked to me. He, he, he said, it's just stuff, Bobby. It's just stuff. And it is. So I, none, of this, none of this stuff matters to me. It doesn't mean anything to me. But it's a better life for my kids. I can give my kids things. If my kid comes to me and says, I want to go to this school, I can say, you can go to this school. If my kid comes to me and says, Dad, I, you know, I need this, I can say, I'll get it for you. If I want to show my kid what, what you know, Big Ben looks like in London, I can take them and I, and I can show them that stuff. And, and that's what life is made of. Life is made of making memories for the people you care about. It's not about dollars and cents. It's, it's not about any of that stuff. So I, I don't, I don't, I, every morning I get up, I don't go write for me. I don't, I don't do it. I write because I love to write. All the strappings that come with it, I hope is a better life for the people that I love. The other stuff, doesn't matter.